Hey guys, it's Matt the Bowtie Guy from Bowtie Health. Today's episode we're going to be talking about how to lose belly fat and do diets really work. Let's find out. Alright everyone, all the messages are pouring in from Facebook, Twitter, emails. I'm so excited to get to each and every one of your questions, but the most popular question I've been getting so far, how to lose belly fat. So nobody likes having a gut or love handles or a paunch or a muffin top, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's not a pleasant feeling when you feel your shirt rubbing up against your belly, uh, if you feel the jiggle when you walk or run, and we don't like it when our pants fit tighter, when our clothes fit tighter. You know, it's displeasing to us aesthetically. Um, however, the bigger problem lies within. The more belly fat you have, the more of something called visceral fat you have. That's fat that collects around your organs inside your body. The more of that you have, the worse off you are. That leads to all kinds of problems. The diabetes aspect, the heart disease aspect, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of these major issues. So the more belly fat you have, the more visceral fat you have, the bigger the problem. Now, for those of you who have gone through menopause, ladies, obviously that's you, um, it gets a lot worse the older you get. And the reason for that is your estrogen levels drop, you have more androgens in your system, that's kind of more male type hormones, um, you unfortunately are going to gain some more belly fat, and it is definitely harder to lose. Now, men, unfortunately, as you get older, that becomes a problem as well. Your testosterone levels fall, and you kind of end up in the same position. You get more body fat, more belly fat, and definitely tougher to lose. So, what does this mean? Why is it different between men and women, but at the same time, why is it also the same? Well, we kind of just talked about the same. Um, you know, as we get older, our, in men, of course, our testosterone levels drop. In women, after menopause, your estrogen levels drop. And so it kind of meets us in the middle in that way. And so this way, we're stuck with belly fat. Now, when you're younger, it's a little bit different. Women, they tend to gain weight around their hips, around their butt, um, their breasts. Uh, men, well, unfortunately, we do gain it in our belly mostly, and that has to do with some of the hormones at play. Uh, when, when you're younger, your estrogen levels are higher, you have less androgens. Uh, men, our testosterone is higher. We have a little bit more affinity to build it in our belly. Um, however, we are fortunate in the sense that we have more testosterone, we typically have inherently more muscle mass, and we can burn fat a little bit faster. Yes, ladies, that is why you hate Every man you know who is dieting alongside you or exercising and trying to lose weight, they typically will lose it a little bit faster or sometimes a little bit more than you. Now, don't fret. We can all lose the belly fat. It is an equal opportunity, well, weight loss process. So the question is, do diets really work? Yeah, they do. Um, you know, low calorie diets, if you're eating, you know, 800 to 1200 calories a day, Anyone can lose weight if they're eating that much. Now, the hardest part is getting into these very specific diets. So something like the Atkins diet or the South Beach diet, these low carb diets. Now, they're great. You will absolutely lose weight. Uh, they're on the basis of ketogenesis. Um, basically, you stop using carbs as your fuel and you start using fat as your fuel. Uh, it is effective. It works. Uh, it has its place in medicine. We sometimes use ketogenic diets for cancer treatments, for seizures, uh, certain brain disorders, things like that. Um, however, you know, it's not sustainable. And that's the problem with all of these diets. Unfortunately, when you start to diet, your body gets used to things. And if you make an extreme change, yeah, you, you can do anything for a month, two months, three months, maybe six months. But after you finish this diet, if you start moving back towards your old ways, you're bound to gain the weight back and it's going to be tougher to hold on to that routine you had previously because it's an extreme. You're not used to it. You know, if you're 50 years old and you grew up eating steak, potatoes, and pasta, me personally, I'm Italian. I love pasta. That's what I grew up on. Nothing wrong with it. But if you grew up with that, that's a long time to be eating those foods. It's a habit you've been ingrained with. And so the hard part is breaking that habit. Now, for me, you know, I grew up in an Italian household. There was food everywhere. And trust me, I love to eat just like anyone else, if not more so. And so because there was always so much good food around, that's what I associate comfort, home, and just family with. Food. That's what we did. That was part of our culture. Now, 
I've eaten that way for the 32 years I've been alive, and that's a hard thing to break. But there is a way to get around it, and there's so many ways to do this. So what's the problem with low-calorie diets? Well, you know, they work. There's no doubt about it. Um, unfortunately, though, your body really only understands two principles, feast or famine. And so the thing you really have to consider is what's your metabolism doing when one of these diets? Um, so if you're reducing your calories by a significant amount, so someone like me, 32 years old, pretty active, um, you know, not too tall, um, not too big, um, but, you know, active. I probably require around 2,100, 2,200 calories a day. And, you know, for someone smaller, less. For someone bigger, more. Uh, if you're not as active, less calories. If you are active, more calories. It's all about fuel. That's what calories purely are. Your food is your fuel. Now, the reason why you have to be cautious when you decrease your calories is if you aren't eating a lot and you're eating much less than what your basic metabolic rate is, that's the amount of calories you need to just simply exist day to day, um, walking, talking, breathing, you know, doing the basic things that everyone needs to do, um, then you really start to slow down your metabolism if you get below that amount. And the reason I say this is because your body only realizes the natural world. It doesn't understand that you're dieting to lose weight. It thinks that there's no food around. It thinks that you're stranded in the middle of a desert and you're basically eating bugs. So the big problem with that is if it thinks there's no food, it's going to slow down your metabolism. The reason it does that is so that you can hold on to your calories so that if there's no food for a while, you might have a little bit of stuff to go off of. And when it stores those calories and slows down your metabolism, that's fat. That's where the belly fat comes into play. So if you restrict your calories, you're basically simulating starving in the desert. And when that happens, you're really going to start to hold on to calories. Now you're going to lose weight, obviously, um, initially, and if you continue to eat that way. But if you start to eat more calories after that, say you've lost the 35 pounds you want to lose, so you lose the 5 pounds you want to lose, the hard part is if you do this diet long enough, your body really has dropped your metabolism to a point where you're just going to gain all of that weight back and it's going to be so much harder to burn that off. Now, I'm not necessarily saying you have to eat more to lose more. You know, some people do believe that. Um, I think it's all about the quality of the calories that you do consume. So, that's my spiel on low calorie diets. Now, a lot of people do focus on the whole low carb phenomenon. Now, ketogenic diets, low carb diets, Atkins, South Beach, um, they fairly, they're similar in a lot of ways, um, but they're different. You know, they have their differences as well, little nuances here and there um, that vary. But here's some of my concerns with a low carb diet. Now, you will lose weight on a low carb diet. There is no question that whatsoever. You know, carbs are a quick, easy, major fuel source for the body. However, carbs can be healthy but carbs can also be horrible, as you know, from these diets. So when you totally abstain from carbohydrates, um, so you get rid of breads, pasta, rice, pizza, baked goods, sweets, muffins, candy, all of those wonderfully delicious sweet things, um, you will lose weight. Those are the bad carbs. Now, here's the other issue, though. If you are completely eliminating carbs and you're not eating healthy, whole, ancient grains, farro, quinoa, brown rice, um, millet, uh, oats, things like that, then you know, you're really depriving yourself of a basic nutrient. And so if you're just consuming lean proteins and fats, that's great in a certain perspective, um, but a lot of times you're doing more harm than good. So when you are consuming a lot of protein and a lot of fats, you are no longer using carbs as fuel. That's the basis of the South Beach diet, the Atkins diet, a lot of these low carb or ketogenic diets. The whole point of ketogenesis is get rid of carbs so your body doesn't know what to use for fuel, so it's next in line is fat. So if you're eating just fats and proteins with no carbs, your body says, well, there's no carbs here, but I have a lot of fats, I'm just gonna use this as fuel. So as it starts to burn those fats in your diet, it also starts burning fats in your body, your belly fat as well. Now, they work obviously. Um, ketogenics have been used for a long time in a lot of medical practice. Um, seizure disorders, uh, brain tumors, other brain disorders, mood disorders, things like that. Um, 
but now it's starting to become a little bit more of a fad in terms of dieting. Like I said, it will work. There's no doubt about this, but it is not sustainable and it's also really not that healthy. So if you start starving yourself of carbohydrates, then you really start playing into an issue where you're burning a lot of fat and sometimes muscle and fuel. Um, you know, the biggest problem with this is if you're not consuming enough carbohydrates, you really can't build the muscle. You need carbs to build muscle. There's no doubt about that. But it's the healthy carbs that you really want. And so when you are dieting like this, it becomes tough. Our culture is totally ingrained in carbs. Everything delicious has carbs. Pizza, pasta, sandwiches, paninis, all the good stuff. We all love it. Cakes, cannolis, all of that. So because of this, our body craves it. Our brain's number one fuel source is pure glucose, which is carbohydrates, sugars. And when you get rid of those carbs and sugars, you get what they call the keto flu, the ketogenesis flu. Your body is actually withdrawing from carbohydrates and sugars. Your brain is addicted to sugar. It has been shown to be as addictive as some drugs. Um, I could easily quote a number, but I don't remember it off the top of my head, um, so I'm just not going to bother, but it is addictive. Your brain wants sugars and carbs. That's why if everyone is eating fast food around you or some sort of sweets around you, it makes you want it because your brain says, hey, that's some food there. That looks good. That's some good sugar. I want it. And so that's the problem. That's my spiel on a low calorie diet and why I think you might want to steer clear. But if you feel that's appropriate for you, you need to lose a lot of weight, uh, it's been prescribed by your doctor or medical weight loss program, it may be a good idea to try it at the very least um, based on their recommendations as they know you best. Now, the whole low carb thing. Is it good? Is it bad? Does it work? Does it not work? Well. I have a couple of views on this, and for me personally, from the research I've read, from my clinical experience, um, patients who've tried it, things like that, um, you know, the low-carb diet uh, revolves around, you know, the uh, Atkins diet, the South Beach diet, the ketogenic diet, things like that. Now, carbohydrates, just as a quick little review, are things like pastries, baked goods, breads, pastas, pizza, rice. Um, white rice, more particularly, um, you know, the simple unhealthy sugars and carbohydrates. Um, healthy carbs are quinoa, farro, uh, brown rice, you know, uh, sweet potatoes, root vegetables, um, berries, fruits, pears, apples, plums, things like that. Those are the healthy carbohydrates. And those are the ones that you really want to include in your diet and ignore the simple or refined carbohydrates, the bad carbs. Um, so these diets basically either completely eliminate or drastically reduce the amount of carbohydrates you take in. Now, carbs are your number one fuel source in your body. That is like high octane fuel. That's the first thing that your body wants to burn as fuel, especially your brain. Your brain uses 100% glucose to function. It craves sugar. It is addicted to sugar. So if you get rid of that, in these diets, um, a lot of them actually call it the keto flu, the ketogenic flu, and you're basically withdrawing from carbohydrates. Your body loves carbs. I mean, we all do, right? We all grew up having, you know, uh, soda as a special uh, treat, juice as a special treat, cakes for our birthday, cupcake, cookies, candy on Halloween, things like that. So this has been deeply ingrained in our culture. I am Italian. Carbs basically run through my body constantly. However, or after learning about the good, the bad, and the ugly of carbohydrates, I started to shift that. Now, because our bodies crave these carbs, it's hard to start to transition away from them. So that's kind of the first downfall of some of these low-carb diets is it's too extreme for some people. Some people are carbaholics. They just love their breads. They love their pasta. They love their rice. They love their sweets. It is hard for people to give those things up, especially when your brain and your body are addicted to them. It just makes it that much harder to do. So right then and there, you're almost born for failure because if your body's craving it, you really eat this all day long and you crave it, it's going to be tough to give that up or even to reduce it significantly enough to lose weight. So that's the first problem with some of these low-carb diets is just getting to do it and maintaining that. Sustainability is crucial when it comes to a healthy lifestyle. So that's my first concern. The second concern is when you start to eat a really low carb diet, you go into ketogenesis. And ketogenesis is great for losing weight. Now, these low carb diets 
they work no question about it. You will drop weight extremely fast. But ketogenesis has been used medically for years um, for seizure disorders, brain tumors, certain types of cancers, brain disorders, neurologic disorders, things like that. Now, when you start to go into ketogenesis, your body really likes carbs for fuel. And because of that fact, you use it for muscle building as well. So if you are greatly reducing the amount of carbs you're taking in and you're relying on burning fat, if you start burning enough fat, you can also start to degrade muscle. Um, your muscles really need carbs for building, for gaining muscle mass. If you talk to any fitness athlete, a fitness model, bodybuilder, things like that, they will tell you that they eat twice as many carbs as they do protein. Now, it's healthy carbohydrates. Um, you can go on YouTube and look at The Rock or um, a lot of these uh, fitness models, bodybuilders, things like that, and uh, Hugh Jackman, you know, a lot of these actors for these roles to get, you know, really ripped and things like that, they eat a diet that consists mostly of chicken or fish, green vegetables, green beans or broccoli, and brown rice. And the reason they do that is because they need almost twice as much carbs as they do protein to pack on that muscle. Now granted, they're exercising five, six hours a day. They're doing it intensely. They have chefs preparing it. They're eating almost five, 6,000 calories a day. They're also burning almost eight to 10,000 calories a day and doing a lot of resistance exercises. But the reason I'm saying this is they consume a lot of carbohydrates, just the healthy ones, because they need it to build their muscle. If they just ate straight protein, they really wouldn't gain a lot of muscle mass. They'll get ripped, they'll get very defined, you see all the muscles, but they won't get mass. And that's the most important thing when it comes to building muscle, you know? Um, so that's the other concern I have. So if you're really trying to lose weight and be healthy, you know, you really shouldn't rob yourself of all carbohydrates. Um, you know, berries are okay. Seeds, grains, those are okay. The healthy ancient grains, like I said before, quinoa, farro, brown rice, sweet potatoes, root vegetables, things like that. Your body's naturally meant to eat those things. We're not naturally meant to eat wheat. Um, have you ever seen wheat in the wild? It's not so pleasant to chew on. It really has to be processed and ground up. And in our society, you're not growing wheat, taking it and grinding it with a stone and then using it to cook it's being heavily processed. A lot of the fiber and the nutrients are gone. And so that makes it even more refined in a simple carbohydrate. So your body sucks it up and quickly turns it to sugar and then quickly turns it to fat. That's a problem. So with these low carb diets, like I said, they do work, but I have my concerns. They're hard to maintain for most people because most people are carbohydrate addicted. And then the other thing is, if you're following a ketogenic diet and a very low carb diet, and you're just mainly eating protein and fats, first of all, you might be choosing the wrong foods. You could, you know, if you want to do a ketogenic diet, all you have to eat is cheese, bacon, sausage, red meat. You know, that's not a healthy diet. It's not a well-balanced diet either. You're missing a lot of vital nutrients and minerals. So that's my, that's my concern, you know, not getting enough nutrients and not being able to sustain it. Um, also, you're not gonna build appropriate muscle mass. If you're just eating protein and fats, you're not gonna build appropriate muscle. When you build muscle, you increase the amount of insulin receptors. When you increase insulin receptors, you more efficiently process carbohydrates and sugars in the body, you typically are healthier. Um, so if you're exercising and you're on a low carb diet and you plateau, it may be because you've reached a point where you've burnt up a lot of this fat and the carbs and now you're starting to break down muscle as you're building muscle. So you're breaking even. You're not really getting past any points. So in order to build more muscle, you have to add in a little bit of carbs. But if you've been deprived of carbs for a while, you may gain some of that weight back and it may throw the whole lifestyle and diet out the window. So that's my issue with some of these low calorie, low carb diets. Now, there are good ways to lose weight that are healthy. And in my opinion, easy. It just takes a little bit of patience, time, and a little bit of effort. Not too much, but a little bit of effort to deviate from your unhealthy ways. So, how do you lose weight healthy and the sustainable way? Well, let's talk about it. So, the biggest thing are fundamentals. You have three things you need to worry about. Diet, exercise, and general lifestyle. So, let's talk about lifestyle first because this is sometimes the hardest for most people in all honesty. Um, stress management is huge. Everyone has heard, heard of cortisol. Cortisol is the stress hormone. Yes, it will put weight on you. It may not rise significantly, but the more stress you are under, 
the more weight you will gain. There is no doubt about it. And if you don't gain weight from stress, it'll make you stress eat emotionally, and that'll make you gain weight. Or if you're not stress eating, you basically are just going to be so stressed that you can't lose the weight. You become resistant to that weight loss because of the amount of cortisol running through your veins. So how do you reduce stress? Well, this is tough. Some of our lives do not allow for de-stressing. But there are simple tips and tricks you can certainly do. If you have the time, prayer, meditation, yoga, um, going out for a hike, sitting out in nature, reading a book, listening to music, or just sitting in a quiet room, just relaxing, breathing, focusing on your, your air, going in through your nose and out through your mouth, counting to three, counting to 10, counting backwards from 10. There are so many little things that you can do throughout your day that can really, really decrease stress. For those of you who are really crunched for time, have a hectic schedule, are very busy, family obligations, kids, work, um, caretaker responsibilities, things like that, there are small little tips you can do to help de-stress. First thing in the morning, close your eyes, take three deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. Just by doing that, you can greatly reduce stress and start your day off on the right foot. Do it before you go to bed. It may even help you sleep. The other thing is just simple stretching. If you give yourself a couple minutes to stretch, you know, reach for the sky, touch your toes, put your arms behind your back, put your hands in front and just flex your shoulders, things like that, that can help. The other thing is counting backwards from 10 or here's another thing, don't laugh, it actually works. If you feel yourself very stressed, close your eyes. Picture a cartoon thermometer right there. Picture it boiling hot red, that's your stress level. And then picturing it getting cooler and cooler and cooler until it turns bright blue with icicles hanging off and then poof disappears. The simple act of doing that somaticizes and calms you down. So try those little things out, they can help. Use a mantra, today's gonna be a good day. I'm not gonna get stressed over blank. Try that out. That can certainly help. Now, the second lifestyle modification that you really can do to help lose weight, sleep. Sleep is one of the most critical parts of a healthy lifestyle. And this is for everything, not just weight loss. So sleep is important because that's when your body recharges its batteries. It's when your muscles build. It's when your digestive tract recalibrates, things like that processes things from the day. So sleep, there's no truly conclusive number that they really hit on, but we do know that if you get less than five hours of sleep or more than seven or eight hours of sleep, it's not good. So if you hit that window of around five and a half, six to just about seven and a half, eight hours of sleep a night, perfect. If you're having trouble sleeping, call your primary care provider, whether it be an NP, PA, doctor, have a real conversation with them. Let them know, is it trouble getting to sleep? Is it trouble staying asleep? And I will definitely do a video all about insomnia and how to get healthy sleep. So make sure you get a nice, good, healthy sleep. If you know you have to wake up early, go to bed early. That's the most important thing is getting that sleep. The other thing for lifestyle, drinking water. So many people do not drink enough water. There is so much debate out there as to how much water you should drink. Is it the eight glasses that, you sh that have been drilled into your head for years and years since you were little? Is it that we get enough water through our food, which is another argument? Or should you only drink when you're thirsty? Now, I'm a big believer in the more water, the better. You know, unless you are overly consuming an excessive amount of water, over a gallon a day, something like that, then I think everyone can stand to drink a little bit more water. Water is important for, for weight loss. It's used in fat metabolism. Um, it's used to hydrate your organs. It's used to hydrate your, your, you know, your muscles, get adequate blood flow. Um, it's good for your skin. It's good for your mood. It's good for your energy level. It's good for your sleep. It's good for your urinary tract, things like that. So if you really do want to lose weight, drink more water. You know, um, in terms of a healthy amount, if you can shoot for 60 to 80 ounces of water, a little more, a little less, depending on how much you drink, just try and drink more. That's the most important part. Now, everyone always asks the question, what about salt water? Does that count? Yeah, it does, but it's not as hydrating uh, and you can't drink as much as regular water. The gas bloats you up, you can't drink a sufficient amount, whereas regular water, you can drink a good amount without feeling as full as you would with seltzer water. Now, the other lifestyle modification, 
alcohol. Yes, some people love it, some people hate it, it causes problems. Um, if used in moderation, it can be delicious, uh, you can enjoy it uh, in a social event. Um, but where does that come into play with weight? Alcohol is basically empty calories. Uh, it's sugar. It's fermented sugar, basically. Um, wine, grapes, fermented, heavily, heavily sugared. Uh, rum, sugar cane, heavily fermented. So these calories immediately turn into fat. Um, there's been some studies suggesting that a couple drinks uh, can completely negate an entire day's worth of exercise. Um, whether or not that's true, we still don't know, but it can be detrimental to some of your efforts in weight loss. Um, you know, a glass of wine can be anywhere from 140 to 200 calories. Um, certain cocktails, depending on what kind you get, um, can be anywhere from 200 to 600 calories, uh, especially if there's juice or soda, something like that inside. Um, but there are healthier options that you can have if you do want to, in fact, have alcohol. You know, wine's okay. Having a glass here and there on a social occasion is fine. You know, for men, two, four to six ounce glasses of wine, yeah, that's okay. Women, unfortunately, you know, you guys have uh, different muscle mass, uh, different chemical processes. Um, for you, it's only one of those glasses. Um, so, you know, wine is okay. Uh, if you happen to enjoy a, um, you know, nice stiff drink, uh, my personal favorite is a nice gin and soda with lemon, um, that's okay. You know, clear liquors are okay as long as you're not adding things to them. Uh, most alcohols are actually okay without adding a lot of things to them. Tequila, same way. Um, but, of course, alcohol should always be consumed in moderation um, and always assume responsibility whenever you're drinking alcohol. But, they are empty calories, so just be cautious. Now, exercise. This is the bugaboo for most people. Um, I see all kinds of patients doing all kinds of things in their variation of exercise. It doesn't take much, just a little bit of time and effort and definitely a lot of patience. So when it comes to exercising, I always recommend patients do both weight training and cardiovascular exercise. Now, it may be difficult for you. Some of you may have other conditions that limit your ability to exercise in certain ways, whether it's a bad back, bad hip, bad knee, uh, COPD, uh, neuropathy, vascular disease, things like that. So definitely speak with your doctor, your physical therapist, your orthopedist, your neurologist, whoever it may be first before considering any exercise and find out what your limits are. Um, there, if you have heart disease, you know, cardiac rehab is a wonderful place. If you have lung disease, pulmonary rehab is a wonderful place. So use your resources that you have through your primary care provider so that you can exercise safely. Now, for those of you who don't have restrictions, uh, who are fairly comfortable with exercising, you know, you've been athletic in the past or, you know, you used to exercise, you just kind of got out of it for a little while, you've gained the weight, now you want to get back into it. Here are my recommendations. So, if you really want to build muscle, the key is doing your cardio at one day and doing your exercise and resistance training another day. It doesn't necessarily have to be separated like that, but if you do both, that's where you're going to see the benefits. Cardiovascular exercise is wonderful. Elliptical, biking, running, jogging, swimming, um, you know, these are great exercises that will help get your blood pumping, get your heart healthy, get your lungs healthy, um, you know, help circulate some of those endorphins, some of those happy hormones. Those are great exercises. They do help burn calories. Now, the reason why you have to have the resistance exercises, you really need to build muscle. You need to weight train. You need to do body weight exercises, push-ups, squats, lunges, pull-ups, things like that. You know, bench press, bicep curls, uh, deadlifts, squats, kettlebell swings, all of those things to build muscle. If you don't have muscle, you can't burn fat. Your muscles love to use fat as fuel if there's not a lot of bad carbs in the area. Um, so I always encourage people just light resistance exercise, get into it slowly and then start to build into the amount of weight you're lifting and the resistance you're using. Resistance bands are great. TRX workouts are great. Now, if you want to combine both of them and you're physically fit, you have no medical restrictions and your primary care provider says green light go, high intensity interval training is a wonderful way to get both your resistance training and your cardiovascular exercise. It will make you sweat, it will make your heart pound, you will be gasping for air, you will feel amazing afterwards. Feel crappy afterwards, amazing afterwards, however. The reason I say this is because studies show that high intensity interval training has been the most effective means of purporting a lot of benefits to the body in a short period of time. So doing 
a 20 minute, 30 minute high intensity interval training workout will get you in great shape. Now, that's if your body and your health allow it. So like I said, please discuss with your primary care provider before you consider any of that. Now, a couple considerations here um, for belly fat specifically. That's been a lot of the questions I've been getting online. Um, so, you know, you can't spot reduce. There's no such thing as, oh, you know, do this exercise, you're going to lose weight here. The key is build as much muscle as possible. If you have a lot of muscle, especially near that area, it's going to recruit a lot more of that fat in the area as fuel and so it likely will help reduce it in those areas. Now, you know, crunches, sit-ups, things like that, yeah, you know, they may strengthen the abs a little bit, but there's a lot more to your core than just your abs. So, you know, planks are a wonderful thing. Squats are a wonderful thing. Um, you know, doing these exercises really helps build muscle in the important places. Now, your leg muscles are the largest group of muscles on your body. If you work out your legs doing squats, and deadlifts and lunges and side bends and all these wonderful things, you will definitely burn fat. And it's, you know, it's, it's more anecdotal than anything else, but typically if you have a really good leg workout, you're gonna start to lose that belly fat as well. So if you mix cardio with this resistance training or you're doing high intensity interval training, this will definitely help. Some simple exercise you can do at home. Chair squats, jumping, you know, just jumping up and down, um, getting a good squat, jumping up and landing down softly, if your body allows it, um, planks, push-ups, and wall sits. If you do all of these exercises and repeatedly in a good circuit of motion for about 15 to 20 minutes every day, you're going to see some differences. You know, if you're normally more active than that, you're going to have to push yourself a little bit harder. Now, women, I am specifically talking to you. Unfortunately, a lot of women, they typically get in the routine of going to the gym and going on the elliptical, walking on the treadmill, um, doing the Stairmaster, things like that. Now, that is great. It's gonna get the heart pumping. It's gonna do a lot of good for you. But in order to lose that weight and get over that plateau, that hump, you know, you may lose weight and then all of a sudden, I, I don't know why, I'm eating right, I'm exercising, I'm not losing any more weight. What's happening, Matt? Typically, it's because they're not doing enough resistance exercise. So get in the gym, ladies, get some weights, get some exercise resistance bands, and start working those muscles. Build muscle. And the more weight you use, the better off you are. Now, do it safely. If you're not sure, get a trainer. Go online, get some information, buy a book and read about it. But start slow and move up gently. Um, once you get to a decent amount of weight, you should you know, really see some results and feel good too. So that's my recommendation for exercise. Do it three to four times a week, a little bit more, a little bit less. You gotta give yourself time for recovery so those muscles can heal and rebuild themselves. Um, so typically three to four times a week um, for about 30 minutes a day, get in some cardio, get in some resistance exercise. That should definitely help. All right guys, the moment you've been waiting for, diet. So personally, I think this is just a healthy diet for anyone to follow. You know, not everything is perfect for everyone, but this is actually the easiest, most sustainable diet you can follow. It's not perfect, but this is what I recommend to all of my patients because it's fairly easy. It's an easy transition to a healthier lifestyle. You know, you likely will lose weight. Your blood pressure will get better. Your cholesterol will get better. Your blood sugars will get better. Um, you know, this is just my recommendation, but obviously before following any dietary changes whatsoever, please speak to your primary care provider before you make any changes. So, how to eat a healthy diet. What is that? So, I like to boil it down to just simple things. Healthy carbs in moderation. So, you know, if you're eating two baked potatoes, you know, a whole bunch of pasta, a whole bunch of rice, things like that, it's just way too much. It's all about portion control in terms of your carbohydrates. And actually, it's portion control for everything. But for your healthy carbs, you want to make sure you're eating just a small, modest amount. So when it comes to carbs, like I said, these are your healthy carbs that you should be eating. Sweet potatoes, regular potatoes are okay. If you have diabetes, you know, you really have to be cautious because it's going to spike your blood sugar, you know, fairly significantly. But, you know, regular potatoes are fine. Uh, so sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, brown rice, quinoa, and farro. Um, barley is okay. Um, and so, you know, root vegetables, um, fruits, things like that. So, what do you need to look out for in terms of portions? A quarter cup is plenty. Half a cup, you know, that's okay. If you're really active or you just worked out, that's fine. Half a cup is okay. When you start getting more than that, you're really putting a lot of strain on your system. 
And so I would be cautious about how much carb you consume. So those are your healthy carbs to have in a meal. All right. Now, vegetables. Vegetables are the best thing for you. That's why mom, grandma, dad, grandpa, uncle, aunts, all that, they always used to drill it into your head. Eat your vegetables. It's good for you. You'll grow up big and strong. Well, there's some truth to that. Yes, in fact, you will. I'm not saying you have to go vegan. I'm not saying you have to be a vegetarian or anything like that. But the more vegetables you eat, the healthier you will be. So if it's a green vegetable, eat it. I don't care how much of it you're eating. Just eat it. Um, broccoli, green beans, asparagus, um, you know, a kale, chard, um, you know, watercress, butter lettuce, things like that. You can eat as much of that as you want. Um, it is healthy for you. It is packed full of fiber, so it cancels out any carbs that may be within it. Um, and some of it actually has a good amount of protein, calcium, mag manganese, all these different vitamins and minerals that are really healthy for you. So if it's a green vegetable, eat it till you are green in the face. Um, you know, fruits. What are healthy fruits? Now, everyone says there's bad fruits and good fruits. You know, that may be true. You might want to be cautious of some of the fruits you're eating if you're trying to watch your weight or you have diabetes or things like that. Um, so, you know, the bad fruits, bad fruits, um, that you really need to worry about are bananas, grapes, melons, um, pineapple is kind of an iffy one, but it does have a lot of sugar with a little bit of fiber. Um, and, you know, fiber cancels out sugars and carbohydrates. So the less fiber it has, the more sugar it has, and unfortunately, the more calories it packs in. Um, so those are really kind of the, the bad fruits. Uh, you can eat them, that's okay, but you know, I really wouldn't eat them uh, constantly or in excess. Um, but there are a lot of healthy fruits out there that are great for snacks, um, great for breakfast, um, things like that. So what are those healthy fruits? Uh, that would be blackberries, blueberries, strawberries, cherries, um, any of the berries really, especially blackberries, they have a lot of fiber um, and that really knocks out a lot of the carbs within them. Um, apples, pears, plums, um, those are great fruits to eat. So the other option, protein. Where does that come into play? So protein you can get from many sources. Now, you can share your protein and carbs in one by having some beans, you know, kidney beans, black beans, navy beans, cannellini beans, um, garbanzo beans, chickpeas, things like that. Um, and so that's great. You know, if you want to make that the centerpiece of your meal, fine. If you want to have a carb and add a little extra protein, do a bean instead of brown rice or a potato or a root vegetable or something like that. Um, you know, if it comes from the ground, eat it. That's what I always say. Um, now, here's the other thing. There are a lot of arguments as to, you know, red meat being bad for you and um, pork being bad for you, things like that. If you're eating them very rarely as a treat in a lean cut, that is fine, especially like a filet. A filet mignon of steak is okay. It's a very lean cut of meat. It's very tender. It's delicious. You know, if you're really craving meat and you have your option between that and a big fatty piece of prime rib, yeah, you might want to opt for the fillet. Bit of a healthier choice. Usually it's a smaller portion as well. Um, so if you have red meat, make it like once, twice a month, something like that. Um, now, your healthy options. Chicken and fish. So fish is a wonderful, wonderful thing for the body. It has all kinds of healthy, unsaturated fats. It has your omega, omega fatty acids. Um, it's a lean source of protein. It's very light. It's delicious. Um, you know, and a lot of people, they typically are either loving fish or they hate fish. Um, so unfortunately, if you're one of those people who hate fish, um, there may be a milder type of fish out there that you like, maybe something like halibut. Um, you know, definitely go for, don't go for mackerel. Mackerel is way too fishy and oily for most, uh, myself included. Um, but there might be a cut out there that you might like. So, you know, give it a shot. Keep an open palate. Um, but, you know, salmon, uh, swordfish, uh, halibut, whiting, gray sole, haddock, um, all healthy fish that you can consume. You know, shrimp is okay. Um, try not to eat too, too much because usually the way it's cooked is, you know, usually in tons of butter or breaded. Uh, so be very cautious with that as well. Um, but if you're having grilled or baked fish, awesome. Um, and then chicken. You know, there's a lot of different cuts of chicken. You know, you have chicken thighs, chicken breast, um, things like that. You know, typically opt for the breast because it has the least amount of fat content. Um, it's very lean, um, it's delicious, and you can cook it multiple ways for multiple different palates. Um, so chicken and fish, as many green vegetables as you want, 
berries, apples, pears, and plums, and your healthy carbs, which is either beans, brown rice, sweet potato, regular potato, uh, or root vegetables or quinoa. So those are kind of just the general dietary changes that you should make. Um, and then of course for snacks, you know, hummus is a great thing. It's chickpeas and sesame oil, things like that. Um, so, you know, that's a healthy snack, especially if you're eating with raw vegetables. Raw celery, you know, is basically you're burning calories when you eat celery. It's just water and fiber. You know, you're chewing burns calories for you. So that's a great, you know, mode instead of pita chips or bread with your hummus. Do some celery sticks, um, you know, and the nuts. Nuts are a healthy snack. Now, everyone thinks peanuts and cashews are nuts. They are actually legumes. They are beans almost. Um, you know, they're okay once in a while, uh, but I wouldn't eat a lot of them because nuts are dense in calories. They're dense in fats. And so if you're trying to lose weight and you're having a handful of nuts and that puts you over, you know, your 2,200 calories for the day, then you might want to reconsider and cut back on those and, you know, maybe eat more veggies, something like that. So you feel fuller longer um, and you don't feel like you just ate only a small handful of nuts. Um, but nuts are healthy, especially, you know, almonds and walnuts. Uh, raw is the best kind. Um, but, you know, certainly uh, if you want to have them roasted with a little bit of salt, Yes, that's perfectly fine. Just be cautious of the sodium. Uh, all you guys out there with heart failure, heart disease, high blood pressure, kidney disease, things like that, uh, certainly chat with your doctor. Uh, make sure you're taking the appropriate sodium amounts. All right, guys, dreaded question. How much can you eat, portion-wise? So I always tell all my patients, if you can fit it in your hand, that's the appropriate portion. Now, I'm not saying a mounding heap of food, but if you can fit a modest amount of food in your hand, that's exactly what you want. Now, if you go out to dinner, obviously you want to get bang for your buck. They're going to give you a huge portion of food for a good price. It looks delicious, but there's a lot of calories on that plate. And one dish of food out at a restaurant can sometimes be almost your entire day's worth of calories. So I always say split it into, into quarters, halves, thirds, depending on how much is on the plate and what you ordered. Um, and take the rest home for two other meals, another meal, three other meals, um, however you see fit. Um, now, how much to eat each day? Typically, like I said, you know, you really want to be cautious in how much you're eating. Now, I'm not saying go on a low calorie diet, we've already talked about that. But the other thing is, is making sure you're having the appropriate timing of meals as well. Now, they say eat six to nine meals a day. And you have people who say, oh, do intermittent fasting, it helps burn weight, things like that. But there's no conclusive evidence to say what works better than others. I always say if you're eating healthy meals, you know, something in the morning, a snack in the mid-morning, something at lunch, something after lunch, something slightly before dinner, and then something at dinner, that's the appropriate amount. This way you don't get hungry. When you're hungry, you make snack decisions, and sometimes those snack decisions can be the cookie, the muffin, or just something extremely unhealthy. And so I don't want you to sabotage yourself. So if you're snacking throughout the day, you're not going to be starving. You're not going to be crazy hungry. And so this way you feel full. And so when it comes time to eat, you say, yeah, I can eat something. And you're going to eat a better portion as well. It's not going to be a huge meal because you've been eating all day. And so you're not starving. You're sufficiently hungry just to fuel that need. So you're going to eat a nice healthy portion size of your hand. So, you know, pick your meals, pick your foods. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, eggs are okay. Chicken is okay. Fish is okay, nuts are okay. If it's a green vegetable, eat as much of it as you want. Berries, apples, pears, and plums, and then healthy carbs. Brown rice, quinoa, farro, root vegetables. So, let's sum this up. So I know this is a long video. It is a complex topic, and I apologize for going on and on and on. But I wanted to get into detail on this because I had many, many messages and emails asking about this topic. How do I lose weight? How do I do it well enough that I can feel comfortable keeping it off and how do I lose that belly fat? So here we are at the end of the video. What do we do? What I want you guys to do, download this app. Go to your app store, go to you know the Apple app store, the Android store, whatever it is, um, and download the Under Armour My Fitness Pal app. It is completely free. It is a great tool to have. It'll let you know what a healthy amount of calories are based on your height, your weight, your age, your activity level, things like that. And it has a whole database. You can scan barcodes. You can type in restaurant meals, uh, grocery store, prepared foods, things like that, or just you know simple basic ingredients. And it'll calculate how many calories and deduct them based off your exercise, 
things like that. So it's a great way to keep track. Now, I tell all my patients, you can't sprint a marathon. You can walk it, you will feel fine, you will do it, you will finish it. It may take you a little longer, but you will be successful. So take your time with making these changes. Don't become a vegan overnight. Don't become Schwarzenegger in the gym overnight. It's not going to work. What I want you to do is every week pick one thing that you should be doing that you're not or it's something that you shouldn't be doing that you are and fix it. So if you're drinking three sodas a day, you know, start now. Only drink two sodas a day and make one of them a seltzer water or a water. And then every week improve upon that. You know, if, if you're drinking three sodas a day, first week, two sodas. Next week, one soda. After that, no soda. Just that alone will help you drop a significant amount of weight. And by week three, you start to create a new habit. You know, the body likes habits, it likes patterns, it doesn't like change. So if over time you sustain this simple little change, it's gonna become part of your lifestyle. And then you can add another small change. And over time, you've made so many little changes that they've added up, but your body's been tricked to think that this is just how you're living now, it's not gonna miss the old way. It might a little bit, but it's going to be easier. It's not gonna be a drastic 800 calories a day, no carbs, just protein, and you know that's it. You can't do anything else. So that's what I would recommend. Slow and steady always wins the race, especially when it comes to your health, especially when it comes to weight loss. So make small subtle changes over a gradual period of time that will work. All right, so de-stress. Do something for yourself. Make yourself happy. Laugh. You know, meditate. Deep breathe. Something like that. Get good sleep. That is huge. You know, six to eight hours of sleep every single night. Set your alarm clock. Make sure you go to bed early. Things like that. Now, water. Drink plenty of water. If you're chugging water as it is, you know, maybe have an, an extra glass or so more. But 99% of the time, no one's drinking enough water, myself included. We're busy, we forget about it, and if you have to do it, it's near impossible. But if you're not thinking about it, it's easy. So try and drink more water. Now, exercise. Like I said, three to four times a week, 30 minutes a day, high intensity interval training, resistance training, cardiovascular training. Uh, if you're not gonna do high intensity interval training, definitely pair up your cardiovascular and your resistance training, build into it slowly. Now, the other thing too is, you know, we just talked about diet, portions. Fits in your hand. Half your plate should be veggies, a little bit of the other part should be protein, and the other little part should be your car healthy carbohydrate. If you make that your meal, I guarantee you're gonna feel full, you're gonna be happy, your body's gonna love you for it, and you're gonna feel incredible. Now, those are the things that you should do to really make the difference. I'm going to start touching on a little bit more detail um, a little bit later. Uh, we'll get into that. But like I said, this is a long video. I just want to sum things up, get you the main gist of diets. Do they work? Do they not work? And what's the healthiest way to lose weight? So I'm sorry for blabbing on and on. I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. This is a disclaimer. You know, I know I'm a nurse practitioner. I don't know everything. I don't know you specifically. I don't know your medical history or all your problems. So I beg of you, please discuss any and all recommendations that I'm making on these videos. Should you want to make any changes to your diet, lifestyle, health, whatever, um, I would certainly recommend you speak with your primary care provider, your specialist, uh, well before you make any of these changes. You know, you got to be safe. Uh, your health is precious. And we want to make sure you're doing the best that you can do. Signing off, I'm Matt the Bowtie Guy. See you later.